Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to share with you some sneak insights into the global rankings, the latest global rankings with regard to fiber to the home penetration throughout the globe. And um, we will have a session, session two after lunch, which will do a deeper dive on these um, figures. But I just want to get, share with you some of the highlights uh, that we've uncovered for this year. Um, firstly, to begin, it's with great relief that I get to announce that the UAE has the number one position for fiber to the home penetration throughout the world with a whopping great 93.7% penetration rate, which is fantastic. And for me personally, I applaud that. I think that's a great achievement. The, the reason I say it's with great relief is um, I met with some of the operators down there late last year, and um, they were extremely passionate about their number one position in fiber to the home rankings throughout the world. And um, they were very vocal about ensuring that they could retain that position, and they were putting massive investment in to ensure that they retained that position. I genuinely wish we could see that same level of passion across the European states. I'm also thrilled to announce that we have a new number one position within the EU. And they are in eighth position globally with a fantastic 45.2% penetration rate. And that's for Latvia, who have now taken the crown off Lithuania, who held that for a number of years. So they should be applauded as well on their efforts. <laughs> Spain continues to power ahead. And where they've managed to accelerate into 19th position globally, with a 24.9% penetration rate, I urge you to keep in mind where they were four or five years ago. That's a fantastic achievement and something that should be recognized. Our hosts here in France are doing extremely well as well. France, thanks to all the recent investments in Fibre at Home, now sees a penetration rate of 11.1%. And again, keep in mind, their investments have only started in the last few years, so you know, they've really picked up the pace quite quickly. And finally, we have two new entrants into our panorama, and for those who are not familiar with the rules of our panorama, the rules of our panorama state that for a country to get enlisted within the panorama, it must have a minimum of 200,000 households, and also it must have a minimum of 1% connected homes. And we've got two new entrants that are joining this year in Austria and Serbia. So welcome to the club, guys. Hopefully this is the start of many great things to come as we go forward. As I mentioned, session two after the break, we'll go into much more detail with regard to the latest fiber to the home figures. So if you want to bring yourself up to speed, that's the place to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor to welcome our next keynote speaker, a fellow Irishman. Our speaker is a barrister. He has been a lecturer in public law in Trinity College in Dublin, followed by a number of years as legal secretary in the Chambers of Advocate General at the European Court of Justice. He's subsequently a member of the Legal Service of the European Commission, and he was head of cabinet, private office for the EU Commissioner Nelly Crowes, when she was commissioner for competition, and then later when she became commissioner for the digital agenda. Please give a warm welcome to our second keynote speaker, Mr. Anthony Whelan, Director for Electronic Communication Electronic Communications Networks and Services with the European Commission. Anthony, thank you for joining us. So the format that we're going to work to um, within this session, we're going to have a Q&A session with Anthony, and he's going to share some of the very important insights um, that are emerging from within the Commission. Um, I'm going to kick off proceedings, if that's okay, um, where I'd like to raise the question with regard to the new gigabit target set by the EU Commission. And why did the Commission feel that an update to the connectivity targets was timely, given that the original targets were still to be achieved for 2020? That's a, a good question, Ronan, uh, because uh, of course, we, we have targets in place, as you say, which have a, a very general scope. Uh, they were focused on 
on uh, rollout throughout the European territory, mainly for residential end users, the idea being that everyone would have 30 megabits per second available to them, and that at least 50% would be subscribing uh, to 100 megabits per second. So, mm -hmm. so why move on? Those standards are, of course, still valid, because we, we need to keep predictability for people who are organizing either public policy interventions or, or private market efforts uh, around targets which are meant to give visibility to, to all the actors in the ecosystem. But in order to give visibility, uh, what is now a three to four year perspective isn't really good enough anymore. So we need to look beyond. That's, that's why we fix basically a, a, a new horizon of 2025, based on experience, based on identified new needs, and based also on, on a greater degree of prioritization. We, we distinguish, for example, three targets, one of them for the socioeconomic drivers, so the, the multi-user centers like businesses, public administrations, and schools, which will clearly be uh, those with the, the most immediate needs, but also demand pullers within their community for, for rollout. We have a 5G target because increasingly we are seeing that fixed and wireless are not separate universes, on the contrary. Sure. Uh, so we aim for at least uh, one major city in each member state to have uh, a commercial 5G service by 2020 with wider rollout, including transport routes by 2025. And then because the, the digital divide general service uh, challenge is still there. We aim for 100 megabits per second available to all uh, by 2025. Now, Antoine mentioned earlier, speed is not everything. Uh, and all, everything I've just said is articulated in terms of speed. Now, the political targets, of course, have a certain simplifying logic because you have to draw the attention of decision makers who are not engineers or specialists. But when you dig down into the whole policy uh, narrative that we develop around it, of course, we are focused on more than gigabit speeds. We're looking at latency, we're looking at resilience, we're looking at an array of parameters that different users will need. Very good, thank you. Um, Anthony, this is the first time that the Commission has proposed very high capacity connectivity to become a regulatory objective embedded in the regulatory framework of the EU. What is the rationale behind this proposal? Why would it be important for very high capacity connectivity to be a regulatory objective for NRAs? And secondly, what is the Commission's vision of very high capacity connectivity? Uh, if you allow it, but I might take it the other way around, uh, the vision and then why we pump it into the, into the regulatory framework. Uh, building on what I just said, that we, we see needs that need to be prioritized looking out to 2025, uh, which at least for certain uh, user groups will certainly be uh, very demanding. Uh, we see a need to, to actually define the ambition, uh, an ambition that is corresponding to the needs, obviously. Uh, and there we find it very difficult uh, to close our eyes to the fact uh, that, that we see very high performance technologies that tick all the boxes that are available to us. I, I don't need to say what it is in this room, uh, although we are sometimes attacked for simply mentioning the word fiber uh, in, in any regulatory context. But sometimes you must call a spade a spade. We, we see uh, a role to define our ambition relative to what we know, and what we know includes what we know about technology. Uh, which is not the same as saying that we then do a command economy with only one technology acceptable or, or, or allowed. Why put it into the regulatory framework? Uh, for at least two reasons. One is just to have a coherence across instruments. We talk about uh, targets and technologies in the area of state aid control, for example. We, we uh, of course, are very directly involved in trying to promote uh, rollout by uh, various actors through uh, EU structural funds. We are working with the EIB on, on, a, on a broadband fund. Uh, it seems only normal that we, we try to get coherence across instruments, including regulation. The, the second uh, linked reason is that we have a regulatory framework that was designed to promote 
competition and then you end user benefits, which remain, of course, uh, absolutely key. But we think it is useful to define outcomes that we would like to see emerging uh, from competition, to, to define outcomes that we would regard as corresponding to end user interest. And that, for us, is the rollout uh, and take up, rollout alone is not enough, of, uh, of very high capacity networks. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, what do you see as the key regulatory levers that the Commission has proposed to foster ubiquitous, very high capacity connectivity? The, there are quite a few. Uh, and the, I, I, will, I will perhaps separate for convenience, fixed and wireless, even though the reality, of course, is that they come together. Sure. I mean, our, our main regulatory lever uh, uh, on, on fixed is the way in which we regulate access to networks uh, and the economic environment that that creates. We see uh, a real opportunity to, to favor infrastructure competition by putting focus on access to the assets that help alternatives to build out and to create the th uh, credible threat that they will build out. Mm -hmm. So a big focus on uh, access to ducts and poles where, where they are available. Uh, we see uh, an important general change in the regulatory environment that we, we seek to focus regulated access to where it is really needed, where competition can't so easily develop on its own. So where it is possible, we, we try to favor it and let it do its work. Where it is not, of course, we still need competitive access in order to make sure that end users are served. But what that leads to, hopefully, is more focused regulation and therefore greater scope for what you might call animal spirits to be, to be released uh, in the sector, but without removing the key role of regulation to favor competition. That, that remains key, but wherever possible, competition to roll out uh, should, should be prioritized. And thirdly, on the fixed side, we see, uh, because the sector has developed in a variety of different ways since this framework was first created, we see a need to uh, send signals on how certain specific business models will be treated so that everyone gets predictability. Co-investment models, wholesale-only models, for example, uh, which can be models better associated with ambitious, uh, with ambitious deployment goals. On the wireless side, uh, it's mainly about uh, how we create favorable investment conditions through the a assignment of spectrum to, to players in the market. And we see a number of key ways to do that. One of them is, is long-term predictability on the availability of spectrum and getting spec spectrum quickly into the market. Another, which is very much linked to fiber backhaul issues, is greatly easing uh, any administrative constraints that may exist for small cell deployment. A small cell is not a wireless mast. It shouldn't be subject to the same planning controls. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, with regard, you've, uh, you've just mentioned uh, uh, two investment models or business models, co-investment and wholesale only. Uh, business model. Uh, why was it really specifically that the Commission felt that there are special rules needed for these two business models to be embedded in the European legislative framework? And what is it more specifically that you're proposing for these two models? Why are they so different from, let's say, the vertically integrated um, investment model? Yeah, well, maybe just to lead into that, I should say, as, as part of the general uh, refocusing of access regulation, we also uh, foresee, even for the more classical business models, uh, for example, greater pricing flexibility because we think that is an important uh, uh, opportunity for players to make uh, long-term decisions on, uh, on investments in, in, in networks. Then, then looking at, at those specific cases, I mean, there are not many, if any, wholesale-only players who are currently regarded as dominant. But we also see very local developments uh, and markets and market analysis may change. So we need to give players who are investing uh, sometimes in, in, in very ambitious networks uh, predictability on what might happen if they ever 
deemed to be the only game in town in their respective areas. Uh, the most important thing there, I think, is that we would not see uh, uh, price regulation as being uh, the norm. It should be something that can perhaps be held in reserve by regulators for cases where abusive behavior is, is, is detected because Typically, a wholesale-only player has an incentive to sell to all the players in the market and to, and to enhance capacity take-up. <coughs> On the co-investment side, we, what we see as an opportunity is that if there are credible threats by alternative players to build, it makes it more attractive for dominant players to co-invest rather than to, as it were, to sit on their hands. Uh, but you, you need to be sure that co-investments take place on terms which allow smaller players to, to genuinely take part, to present them with a real investment opportunity, uh, but also a real reason to co-invest, which is that once a co-investment opportunity is made available, uh, it can't simply be like before that one would take the option, well, I'll, I'll wait and see. Uh, we, we are trying to put it up to everyone in such a case uh, to, to invest together. You, you minimize uh, overall capex while keeping sustainable competition opportunities on the network that is built because everyone has defined conditions for, for access to the capacity. Um. You have also mentioned um, that the Commission seeks to enhance the investment environment for wireless networks. Um, what is it more specifically that you're proposing? You have mentioned the 25 years long licenses, but what else is it that a Commission is proposing to harmonize across Europe to help ultimately 5G network development? Yeah, and there are an, an array of issues. Uh, some things, of course, we can do with current tools, uh, identifying and harmonizing relevant spectrum, including in, in much higher parts of the spectrum, is something we're already working on with the member states uh, and, and moving ahead quite quickly. Uh, but technical harmonization has its limits. The, the conditions under which spectrum is put into the market uh, will be pretty decisive uh, to determine how, how quickly and, and how deeply 5G is rolled out. Uh, uh, so in addition to long-term horizons, uh, the acceleration uh, of the assignment of, of new bands is something that we think we feel new European tools for. We think we need to have uh, a, a clear opportunity under the, the uh, spectrum rules uh, for uh, unlicensed spectrum and sh spectrum sharing because with the new types of bands that you will use for, for, for 5G, uh, the traditional models which will remain very valid of course for, for the 7, 800, 900 uh, 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 bands uh, of individual licensing need to be complemented. It's not a matter of one over the other but of having a, a, full, a full toolbox. And we need uh, uh, spectrum regulators, there have been some bumps in the road in the last few years, to learn from each other. And that, for us, is, is a matter not of harmonizing, but of putting spectrum regulators together to give advice to each other, to share best practices, and to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. Very good. Um, when regulating a dynamic industry with rapid technological developments, such as our telecoms industry, how can we ensure the regulatory environment does not hamper innovation? For example, when we look at some of the new innovations coming then to track like network slicing, etc., how do we ensure that some of the current policies that are in place do not hamper the innovation that we can expect to see in the future? I, I think I'm, most regulators uh, act by the, the motto, first do no harm. So uh, we always try, I think this is as true of, of the national regulators that we interact with uh, as it is of the Commission, we, we try to uh, avoid solving problems before they even appear because they, they may not appear in the, in the shape that we know. But at the same time to create frameworks so that people have a certain idea of, of how things may pan out. That may seem a bit contradictory, but that's how the world is. Best example using the, the network slicing case you, you mentioned, there was a, a I think 
a good deal, one might say more heat than light generated over the last two or three years on uh, net neutrality rules in Europe and how they would pan out in particular for, for future networks. I, I think in the legislative process on those rules and then in the more detailed guideline development with, with uh, the NRAs in, in Berwick, we, we have found uh, good, clear principles to work by. There is a clear opening in the legislation for different types of enhanced value uh, optimized quality services to meet specific needs. Uh, the guidelines developed by Berwick have uh, signaled, among other things, very explicitly, this was a big demand from the sector, that network slicing is one possible means by which these sorts of optimized services can be provided. It doesn't say much more than that, and that's probably good, because we, we, we don't know exactly what sort of specific challenges uh, these sorts of, of new ways of managing networks will, will throw up. But as long as they are developed in ways that maintain uh, a, a fair allocation of capacity to your general uh, internet service, uh, then I'm sure we, we're on a good path. And perhaps the most important thing is that there is a, a shared understanding among regulators is that this is not a permission to innovate system. Uh, no one has to come and apply to the Commission or BEREC or to NRAs to provide a so-called specialized service. They develop it, they develop the use case that it corresponds to, and they will respond to questions if asked, but, sure. but that's, that's how it will work. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions in from Twitter. Um, I think we've got some time um, to go through a couple of them at least. Um, Elizabeth, maybe you want to start? Um, we have a few questions, I think, which relate to the acceleration of adoption and demand. Um, can public sector, can regulators do more, actually, to help demand increase for very high capacity connectivity? I, I think it is difficult for, for regulators in the sense of, of market regulators to, to bring forward demand. It depends upon the scope of, 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 their, of their competences. Uh, and the, you cannot legislate demand into existence. You can favor demand by making sure uh, that the supply into the market is competitive, because then you will, uh, in principle, have a price that... that, uh, that that, that promotes demand. And I think your own numbers show that when investments are made in our generally competitive European markets, the take-up uh, follows in, in what we, the Commission, have called a virtuous circle of, of build-out up, build and take-up. So that market assurance uh, aspect isn't directly demand creating, but it is certainly demand enhancing. I mean, after that, of course, there's a whole array of areas where the public sector can lead uh, in, in education, for example, in the connecting of schools, which is, which is one, of our, uh, one of our targets. Uh, children will not only be better educated and, and more ready for, for the future society and economy, but they will also be demand vectors in, in their own homes, if I may say. Um, health services, public services, these are all uh, an important uh, part of that. And the public sector has an important role to get out of the way of demand. I get back to things like planning and, and other restrictions uh, or electromagnetic restrictions which are, which are you know, uh, fractions of recommended World Health Organization levels. The, these all make network build out more expensive, not just for wireless, but also for the backhaul that, that underpins it. I'm sure. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for one quick last one. Um, there was one that was on the screen just previously, it's rolled off now, but it's with regard to how can we accelerate? There are certain countries that it saddens me to say are laggards with regard to the adoption of broad fiber deployment. How can we really motivate them to engage in a more um, broader fashion for deploying fiber to the home to its citizens or fiber to, you know, the antenna if it's part of a 5G system, for example? Uh, I, I think there are some countries who have been, uh, let's say, historically very happy to see uh, perhaps more rapid but also more short-term uh, investments who are, who are beginning to, to see that longer-term uh, 
uh, ambition is, is important for their overall policy mix. Um, in part, and, and this gets back to the question of, of, of targets, they are of course not everything or far from it, but in part what gets measured gets done. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antoine earlier pointed out that on one of the measures that, that we have been using to date or of general next generation access rollout, uh, France was not doing so well. I think it was 50% uh, for, for last year relative to 70% plus at the European level, mm -hmm. um, which is taking a sort of 30 megabit per second benchmark. If the benchmark becomes 100 megabits per second for all by 2025, it may be that France suddenly looks very different, uh, just to, to speak of, 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 of where we are. Um, uh, in that case, I mean, the, the, speaking of Marseille, you know, the, the French connection takes on a whole new and more, more positive spin because they have taken uh, perhaps a, a more slow-burning but, but longer-term approach to the networks they feel they will need uh, in future. So, so inter interstate competitive forces should help continue to drive things. It's part of it. Very good, very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Anthony Whelan. Please give a warm round of applause for him coming along today.